Greetings, happy warriors, and welcome to another episode of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thanks for being tuned into the show. And thanks for being part of the show. As always, I express my appreciation to you for your help in telling other people about the show. You've been doing a great job at that, and our growth figures reflect that. Our numbers of subscribers grow, and all of that is not only gratifying, but actually also very helpful. Today, we are talking about ancient solutions for modern problems. So let's start off by trying to think of three things you could do to horribly harm your life right now. Here's an idea. Why don't we take turns at it? Okay, I'll, I'll suggest one and then you suggest one, okay? Uh, here's my first one. Commit a major crime. Your turn. Okay, my turn again. Betray your marriage. Your turn. Now mine. Pick up and move across the country without telling anybody. Okay. I'd love to hear the ones you're suggesting, but I think you'll agree it's not that hard to come up with things you could do that would irreparably damage your life. Behave promiscuously, contract a disease, or... Uh, how about drive recklessly and crash your car spectacularly? Start drinking alcohol heavily or taking drugs regularly. Here's one. You may have already thought of this one. Quit your job without an alternative landing site. Here's another one. Incredibly destructive, but you may not have thought of this one. Start gossiping indiscriminately and extensively about your friends to your other friends. Become estranged from your family. Start overeating and quit exercising. And so on and so forth. It's really not hard, right? Think of ways to damage your life. Yeah, easy. Now, try and think of three things you could do right now that would dramatically improve your life. A little harder, isn't it? Well, one of them would be to subscribe to the show if you've not done that already. So please go ahead and uh, hit the subscribe button, like it, and uh, away we go. I'd love it if you took care of that right now. Um, also, on the website at rabbidaniellappin.com, you will find a new video course. It's called The Gathering Storm. And uh, it will astound you when you see how incredibly similar current conditions are throughout the Western world to the events and circumstances that led up to the flood. Uh, also, Wherever you get books, go ahead and take a look at The Holistic You, integrating your five Fs, your finance, your family, your fitness, your faith, and your friendships. So those are the first of the three things you could do to dramatically improve your life. Subscribe to the show. Check into the Gathering Storm video course at rabbidaniellappin.com and get yourself a copy of The Holistic You. Anything else? Well, it's a little harder, isn't it? Because it is much easier to destroy than to build. It's much easier to think of destructive ideas than constructive ideas. That is something called spiritual gravity. But you see, if you don't acknowledge, if you don't realize, if you haven't been able to learn the reality of a spiritual dimension to life, well, that's not going to make any sense to you. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave you 
to think of the things you could do that would dramatically improve your life. And if you cannot think of any, well, then you really need a copy of The Holistic You because that is exactly where you will find out the most important things for your own particular personal circumstances, things that you can and should do now to put your life on a better track. So if we were to take a look at the Holistic You book, it's a comprehensive life guide, uh, integrating your five Fs, your finances, your family, your fitness, your faith, and your friendships. You'll notice that every one of the destructive actions that I spoke about a few minutes ago fell into one of these five categories. For instance, gossiping shatters friendships. Betray your marriage. Well, that's family. Use alcohol and drugs. Fitness, your physical fitness. Quit your job. Finances. But of all the things I listed, and I'm sure you listed some yourself, I don't see any of them talking about faith. So what is going on? Maybe when Susan and I wrote The Holistic You, we should have left out faith. We should have just made it friendships, family, fitness, and finance. But you see, if we'd have done that, we'd have been betraying you. We'd have been betraying the truth. We'd have been misleading you and giving you something of very limited value, you see. Because I can easily see how to damage my life by ignoring or even sabotaging my family life. I can see how to damage my life by undermining my friendships and my social life. I can understand how to damage my life by imploding my financial life. I can see how to ruin my life by shattering my fitness or health. But how on earth do I imperil my life by obliterating the faith dimensions of life, especially if I don't have a particularly vibrant faith life to begin with? I'd like to explain this. Your life is a very complex system, mine too. So complex that in the vast storehouse of human knowledge, there is no answer to how life began. That's right. No answer at all. There is an answer to how the first form of life became the second and how, say, crocodiles turned into racehorses. That is evolutionary biology through random natural selection. Or random mutation and natural selection, I guess I should say. But there is no answer, not even a bad one, for how a world of minerals like granite and iron ore and organic material like wheat and oak trees turned into a puppy or a goldfish. Please don't think this is a simple problem. If you think I'm exagger exaggerating and you research it, you'll soon enough come across the Miller-Urey experiment of 1953, where they put some um, organic materials um, into a flask and they ran sparks through it to sort of simulate lightning in a primordial soup. And um, out of that came an elementary form of amino acid. But what it did not do is produce even one living cell, let alone an organism. Now, you may be skeptical about this. You may think, oh, he's just saying that. But it's obviously it was a very important experiment that showed the origin of life. Look, I've got only one question to ask you. If that is true, if the Miller-Urey, and again, you know, I much prefer not depending on experts or scientists or officials or studies or surveys as much as possible. I like using my own cognitive abilities, and I want you to do exactly the same. And so just logically, without knowing the details of the Miller-Urey experiment, but only knowing the abstract and knowing the claim, 
Here is my one simple question. If the Miller-Urey experiment in 1953 actually produced any sign of life, even a minuscule, microscopic, tiny piece of evidence for abiotic production of life, which means a production of life from, you know, mineral origins, wouldn't you have thought that it would be followed up, well, surely sometime in the past 70 years? That's how long has gone by since the Miller-Urey experiment. Where are the follow-up experiments? Look, let's look at a few other things that happened in 1953, okay? In 1953, the double helix structure of deoxyribonucleic acid, that was discovered. It was the molecule containing the genetic instructions for the development of all living organisms. Now, that was just the start. That work led to the genome research and even things like DNA evidence used in forensic investigation came as a result of what started in 1953. It just didn't stop. They kept going. The original 1953 experiment and, and result, well, that was just the beginning. It didn't stop. You know what else happened in 1953? The great mathematical genius Alan Turing wrote a computer program for computers that did not yet exist. Well, he died a year later in 1954. But the work that he started continued because it was so promising. What he was able to come up with forced people to continue working on his ideas. And it resulted in the great supercomputers and the beginning of quantum computing, all built on the back of his successful work. But where is all the work built on the back of the Miller-Urey experiment? It doesn't exist. You know what else happened in 1953? Jonas Salk produced his first polio vaccine. For the next 40 years, work continued on ever more effective polio vaccines until the disease was all but eradicated by about 1995. There are many more examples of breakthrough work done in 1953 that continued to expand and improve on the original work. Yet, the Miller-Urey experiment came to a dead halt. No work continued because there were no meaningful or worthwhile results to continue building on. So please be very clear on this. Nobody on planet Earth has any materialistic explanation, theory, or possible evidence to understand how life arrived on planet Earth. I did say materialistic explanation because obviously I do have an understanding of how life arrived on planet Earth. Yet, you can see at any rate that this is how complex life really is. And your life is not just a cell or a collection of cells. It is a massive matrix of intersecting structures having to do with your health, your relationships with different classifications of people and with things and with knowledge and with a vast intangible reality, the infinite world of the spiritual. And one of the reasons that we wrote The Holistic You is to help readers understand just how all these intersecting structures that make up your life impact and influence one another. For a brief example of this, just ask yourself, does looking after your health, your fitness, impact you socially? I think you'd probably respond, of course, because if you feel good about yourself, you'll be more outgoing, right? Have you ever noticed that people who are self-conscious about the bad condition of their teeth do not smile much? It's perfectly natural and perfectly normal. 
That's one of the reasons that one of the main advertisements that dentists use is they speak about your smile. Because people with bad teeth do not want to expose the part of themselves that they think looks awful. That's right. There is a good enough reason to go to a good dentist. It'll make you smile more and thereby connect more easily with other people. See, if you're a bit overweight or you tend to be out of breath, that too will inhibit your socializing. And so working on your fitness also impacts your friendships. And looking at it from the other side, most people, and yes, that means even you and me, we tend to be a bit awkward around people with health problems. Oh yeah, our sympathies are aroused by those in bad health, sure. But that is different from wanting to befriend them or spend time with them. You see, there is a spectrum line that runs from vibrancy and full of life at one end and all the way to death at the other. We're all, ex we're, we're all attracted to vibrancy and exuberantly evident life force, and we are all a little repelled by death. Again, perfectly natural and perfectly normal. The closer we are to possessing the aura of a flamboyant life force, the more attractive we are to others. So yes, I think we agree. Fitness leads to friendships, you know, generally formulated. Continuing this theme, does having more friends, not Facebook friends, but people who will, say, return your phone call or your email within 24 hours, will having more real friends lead to financial improvement? Unquestionably. You've heard me say, and it's true, the more people who know you, like you, and trust you, the more your ability and your potential to serve people and to make money. All you have to do is figure out how best to serve all those people who know you, like you, and trust you. So does, have, does having many friends and healthy finances help you on your F for family as well? Well, there are two cases to analyze, right? One is if you're married. The other is if you're single. My assumption is that most single people are smart enough to want to avoid going through life alone, and they do wish to be married. There are exceptions. For instance, you know, there are folks who are widowed or divorced, who have children, and are comfortable with living alone. But generally speaking, it's safe to say most single people wish they were in a beautiful, loving, committed, fantastic marriage. So back to analyzing whether having friends and finances helps in both our two cases, married and single. Again, two possible cases. You're married and you're male. And you're married and you're female. Well, let's take a look. So we're looking at married male first. Having and making more money than your wife is phenomenally important for your marriage. I know this is a rough thing to, to say for many people because um, it's, uh, it, it's hard for many people to pull that off. It's not a reality for many people. And so I'm saying something that could hurt you, that could cause you a, a sense of deep dismay. But telling the truth, teaching you how the world really works is perhaps nonetheless important. Having and making more money than your wife is really, really important for your marriage. Being the financial giver and the bearer of financial responsibility in a marriage is a wonderful place for a man to be. A fantastic place. Your marriage is infinitely better, stronger, and you're able to build it limitlessly if you 
the man carry the burden of, man, of, of, of the finances. And by the way, the woman is typically far happier too than when she feels that she must bear the financial burden. This sort of thing didn't have to be said 50 years ago, but today, not only do I have to say it, but I have to say it almost apologetically because so many people have been indoctrinated by the culture to say things like, well, that may have been true in 1954, but it's not true in 2024. Today, we've got the benefits of many years of feminist thinking, etc., etc., etc. Next case we're looking at is you're married and you're female. If the financial abundance is yours personally and separately from community property, you certainly should be aware of the peril it poses to your marriage. It can be handled, but you must know what you're doing. If the, if the financial abundance is the marriages, in other words, community property, all is wonderful. And so financial abundance, good for married people, yeah. Now, what if you're single? Always two cases, right? Male and female, boys and girls. Now, here's a word of warning. It's like I just said. We constantly read things like, and I'm, I'm actually quoting it. Well, yes, maybe that was true in our grandparents' day. Or maybe that was true in 1954. But today, we know better. Today, we have feminism. Today, we have progress. Today, we have scientific knowledge. Whatever it is, put in your thing. And the presumption is that none of the wisdom of the past holds true anymore because it's been superseded by modernity. Now, if the discussion is in the context of anything scientific, anything having to do with the physical, material world, it might be true. However, in anything having to do with male-female family interactions, anything to do with money, yeah, pretty much everything that is really important in your life it's like saying about the problems of, say, you know, not getting, not getting along with your sister. Well, today it's different from our grandparents' day. We now have food coloring and popcorn. Look, sibling discord presented similar problems to your grandparents as it does to us. We may have better phones and cars, but food coloring and popcorn is as relevant as feminism and scientific knowledge when it comes to family relationships. That is why I speak of offering you ancient solutions to modern problems. I won't offer ancient solutions to retaining radioactive exposure in a nuclear electricity generating plant. I will never offer ancient solutions to repairing the fuel injection system in your late model car. I will never offer ancient solutions to the challenge of cooking on a gas range that has a powerful air conditioning outlet blowing down on it. But when it comes to those things that never change, our relationship with our families, and that does include intimate physical relationships, and our relationship to money, our relationship to friends and to our own physical bodies, and finally, to our relationship with God, newer is not better. Ancient solutions are what are needed to the modern problems of creating, maintaining, and growing those relationships. Let's face it, I don't think modern life has proven so successful at any of those aspects of life. Family life guided by modernity, which means basically the elite university academic world has just been a dreadful failure. I don't have to describe what it's done to finances. Just see what the university educated elite has done with the economy. So distorting the miracle of the marketplace so as to drive virtually all American manufacturing out of the country, mostly to Asia, 
and so mismanaging a primary responsibility of government so as to welcome the inflation that is ruining the finances of an entire nation. What has a university culture influence done to friendship? <laughs> Easy to answer. The Western world suffers from a well-known notorious epidemic of loneliness. People of all ages have disconnected from other people. No, when I speak of the need for ancient solutions to modern problems, I speak the truth. Heaven knows, modern solutions to ancient problems really haven't worked out too well for anybody. There are very few aspects of modern life that haven't been shaped by the university culture. Think about politics. President Biden is the 46th president. Out of all of them, about 13 have had no university education. Uh, James Buchanan, James Madison, most recently Harry Truman, James Monroe, Andrew, Andrew Johnson, Andrew Jackson, Zachary Taylor, Abram Lincoln, Grover Cleveland, Franklin Pierce, Thomas Jefferson, John Tyler, William Harrison, that's about, uh, Millard Fillmore, that's right. Oh, and George Washington, most notably, George Washington, no university education. Would you feel, oh, let me say, it, this all ended in 1953. No president since 1953 has not had a degree. Tell me something, simple question. Would anybody say that since 1953, presidents have all been wiser than they used to be in the United States of America? Would you say that from 1953, American presidents have made fewer mistakes than the ignorant, non-university educated predecessors? No. Universities have succeeded in brainwashing people that a four-year degree is necessary to successfully do jobs like customer service, teaching elementary and nursery school. I saw about a year ago, the Wall Street Journal ran a poll that was conducted by that paper and a nonpartisan research group, NORC, N-O-R-C, I don't know what it stands for, National Organization or something, um, but it's based at the University of Chicago. And they discovered that, this is about a year ago, 56% of Americans agree with the statement, a four-year college education is not worth the cost because people often graduate without specific job skills and with a large amount of debt to pay off. Universities in collusion with government have made themselves indispensable by persuading employers to request a degree with a job application. <laughs> this is like grocery stores around the country colluding to make people prove that they've eaten an apple every morning before they are allowed onto any form of transport. It's ridiculous. Not only do universities have the monopoly as sort of gatekeepers to almost every aspect of the economy, they use their power to indoctrinate and propagandize a worldview that yet further empowers the institution of the university. If we talk of degrees that actually will allow you to enter a high-paying occupation, my comments need to be modified. But there are precious few of those. Professional schools... STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that's about it. Teacher training colleges are a joke. What is the underlying schematics? Big question I want to ask you now. What is the underlying schematic that makes universities work? In other words, for instance, in business, what is the underlying schematic that makes business work? It's called making a profit. For medicine, it is or should be about healing people. For aircraft manufacturers and airlines, it is rapid, safe, economical transport. 
but what is it for universities? Well, of course, they would say education, of course. But you see, healing people, I get. Safe, rapid transport, I get. But what does education mean? What does it mean? And if they're not able to define it, which they're not, it's meaningless. I'll tell you what the purpose. I'm going to tell you now the entire underlying schematic of universities. Are you ready? <laughs> it's. Uh, I know you're going to you're going to roll your eyes at first, but but bear with me. Here is what it is: it, the underlying purposeful schematic of universities is to provide and inculcate a secular materialistic worldview, thereby replacing the traditional God-centric worldview that was prevalent until then. You hear that? It's to promulgate a secular materialistic worldview. Let me explain, okay? There are only two ways to answer what may be life's three most basic, compelling, and existential questions. Here they are. Where did we come from? Where are we going to? And what are we supposed to do in between coming and going? You know, when people say, you know, I want my life to be meaningful. I want to do a meaningful job. People, all they're saying is, how do I answer these questions? Where did we come from? Where are we going to? And what am I supposed to be doing in between coming and going? Well, each of those three questions can only be answered in two ways. Where did we come from? Well, either we were placed here by a good and loving God who created us in his image and put us here. Or alternatively, through a lengthy process of unaided, materialistic, random evolution, primitive protoplasm became proctologists and um, uh, bookkeepers. Those are the only two ways to answer the question of where we came from. Where do, are we going to? Again, only two possible answers. We either go to death, worms, and rot, or we go to an eternal spiritual life for which this life was merely a preparation. Those are the only two answers. What lies at the end of our lives? either rot, oblivion, emptiness and nothing, or an eternal spiritual life. There's no other choice. What are we supposed to be doing in between coming and going? Well, either hedonism, living life to the full, you only go around once. Or alternatively, you know, connecting with God and living one's days as closely as possible to his design. That's it. And in each of these three questions, one of the answers is a university-centric answer. It is an answer based on secular materialism. And in each of the questions, the other alternative answer is based on a God-centric worldview. That's it. What I've told you is unarguable. It's, it's as simple as that. In the same way, many other human questions can also be answered in two different ways, either through evolutionary biology or through a God-centric creation worldview. Why do women prefer higher status men? Evolutionary biology says it's simple to ensure a higher probability of survival for their offspring. God-centric creation well, women prefer higher status men in order to encourage men to achieve, encourage men to build a better world. All of that comes because men are trying to impress and acquire and have women who admire them. 
That's a powerful motivation. Hey, why do all fetuses start off as female? Evolutionary biology has its answer, and a God-centric creation worldview has its answer, right? That the natural default condition is female, and that being a male requires an incredible jolt of energy, whether it is testosterone in utero, or whether it's from parents and society to a male child, but there's a spiritual explanation in addition to the evolutionary biology explanation. Hey, how did money and trade come into being? Again, an evolutionary explanation, or alternatively, a God-centric view that God wanted us to trade with one another because people who trade with one another end up loving one another, meaning if you've got a successful business arrangement with somebody, you really do not want him to die. You really don't want anything bad to happen to him because you want this to continue because trade benefits both parties. Hey, why is the proportion of ocean on the Earth's surface almost identical to the proportion of water in the human body? Again, a geological materialistic explanation or a spiritual God-centric explanation. Hey, how is it that even identical twins with the identical DNA have different fingerprints? Evolutionary biology explanation. Well, we've got to postulate the possibility of something called epigenetics. We've never actually seen it, but it must exist. Alternatively, a God-centric spiritual explanation the uniqueness of every single human soul. And our fingers are an essential part of our God-given creativity. And so on and so on. It's not that I reject the science. Please don't think that. I do not reject the science. I love learning about science and technology and engineering. Uh, I worked as an electrical engineer. I taught science and mathematics. But I do not believe that that is all there is. I know it's not all there is. I know that we live in a reality that is part physical and part spiritual. And for that reason, the Bible in the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 10, take a look at this, by the way, it's a really interesting verse. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Yeah, that's exactly right. It is inevitable. The, the, the role of God is so essential a component in understanding reality that if you are determined to leave it out, you are omitting a major leg of your understanding of reality. Let me quote to you a wonderful scientist. He unfortunately died about three years ago. Uh, he was an evolutionary biologist. He was a self-described atheistic. He was atheist. Um, he was uh, of Jewish ethnicity, and um, he was a really important guy. His name was Richard Lewinton. And here is what uh, Dr. Lewinton wrote. By the way, I, I quoted in full in the Holistic You book. Here's what he wrote. I'm, I'm going to read the whole thing just because it's so awfully good. He's honest. He's unbelievably honest. Here is what he says. Our willingness, it means ours, he means we in the university, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. By supernatural, he means spiritual. We, he says, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, 
in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Dr. Richard Lewinton is admitting that materialism, secular materialism, has become its own religions, its own religion. Many of its parameters are set by an absolute and faithful belief that there is no God. Is that scientific? No, but it is scientism. So um, we've got to understand that this is why the F of faith is part of the 5F program we teach in the Holistic U. One simply cannot ignore the spiritual part of life. It is vital for understanding reality. It is vital for acquiring wisdom and it is absolutely indispensable for peak success in each of the other four Fs, right? The finances, family, friendships, and fitness. And that is the entire problem with a university-centric society. It is inaccurate. It promotes a worldview that is at odds with reality. Are you surprised that universities push the argument that boys can be girls and girls can be boys? Are you surprised that a university-dominated culture and a university-dominated pharmaceutical industry and a university-dominated um, mental health industry and a university-dominated physical health industry encourage boys to try and become girls and girls to become boys. Totally at odds with reality. But yeah, that's the whole point. And it's for that reason that I question whether most people should go to university. If a man becomes an aircraft mechanic or a construction rigger, he has many advantages. He's earning good money long before his former friends who went to university are still trying to complete their useless four-year degree in gender studies. He has no debt, but he's actually making money. He has self-respect. He understands that the things he has been taught are true, and they jive with the real world in which he lives and operates. If a woman instead of going to university, becomes an executive assistant or a flight attendant or a dental hygienist or a sales rep and or many, many other things. And don't for one moment think that every woman who gets a four-year degree is headed for the executive suite of a large corporation. It's not how it works. You only have to see and read the complaints of women who took four-year degrees came out with debt and are ending up with menial jobs. Partially, there is the, the fault of universities. And so, please don't think that I'm putting women down. I shouldn't have to explain myself. Um, but what I'm saying is that if instead of going to university, a woman does an apprenticeship and on-the-job training uh, to become you know, some of the things I said and many other things, there's a big advantage she has. And I'll tell you what it is. And that is most women 
would like to be in a lovely marriage, raising their children in a lovely family. That's what most women would like. Trouble is today, the majority of women taking four-year degrees in universities, the, the, the majority of students taking those degrees are women. There are more women than men on the university campus. And um, that means that apart from everything else, because of what I said earlier, most women prefer marrying a man of higher status, a university-educated woman has been indoctrinated to believe that higher status means more university education instead of what it should mean, which is, hey, making more money. Let's stick with reality. And yes, admittedly, we do confer status upon university professors, but we are wrong to assume that that is a higher status than a business professional who never took a day of university in his or her life, but who are making three times what the university professor is making. And most university professors earn extravagantly inflated salaries. If you ever wonder why infl uh, tuition costs have gone up as in the way they have. And so what I'm saying is that um, if it is indeed true that most women yearn for a great marriage and raise, having children and raising them, then going to university means that they are diminishing the likelihood of that ever happening. Because what they are looking for now is a man who has a higher university degree than they do. And that means that that man is going to be older than they are. And what they are forgetting is that men are not looking for women with high university credentials. No, they're not. They're looking for women who are pretty and kind and gentle and who are fun to be with and conversational and, and laugh a lot. That's what men are looking for. That's the kind of girl we want. And so the girl who's now invested four years of her life in a university degree is now looking for a guy who has more university education than she does. And all of this is a distortion. All of this is unwise. All of this is not reality because that guy has better choices available to him and he'll take them. Hence, the large number, may I say, somewhat embittered older single women who may well play a significant role in transforming the politics of countries like the United States of America. But if instead of that, women took my advice and gave up on wasting four years in a university that gives them little of value, lands them with considerable debt, and presents them with a distorted view of reality. If instead of that, they did what I suggest, well, now they won't have been wrongly indoctrinated by the university system, and they'll understand that all they're looking for is a good man, a dependable man, a man whose word can be counted upon, and a man who is making good money. And so now that woman does not rule out a, an aircraft mechanic or a, um, a, a construction rigger or any of the other possible options. I discussed them in last week's show. That's right. She doesn't rule them out. And so her chances of marriage are ever so much better. The university woman wastes four years at college and then she's been so indoctrinated by the uh, lies of feminism that she spends the next four years focusing on her career. And finally, when she is 28 or 29 or 31, she suddenly says, well, now it's time to stop playing around. Now it's time to be married. 
The honeymoon is over. I've got to get married now. That's what she's saying. But it doesn't work out that way because the guys she's looking for are already married to dental hygienists or nurses or other lovely young girls who don't come with the handicaps of that girl who spent four years in university. Oh, I can just see, am I going to get into trouble for today's show? <laughs> oh, I can just tell the kind of letters and comments and mail I'm going to get. And I welcome it. I, uh, I really expect you to already know that my job is not to massage you with warm butter. It's to tell you the truth about how the world really works. And that, my dear happy warriors, is precisely what I have been doing in this show today. So thank you again for being part of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. And uh, thank you for all you do. And thank you for your support. Thank you for getting a copy of our latest book, The Holistic You. And uh, thank you for being happy warriors. In fact, you might want to join our happy warriors community. You can do that also at the rabbi Daniel And uh, you would be most welcome. So until we are together again next week, I am your devoted rabbi, as I wish you a week of incredible growth as you move onwards and upwards with your finances, your family, your faith, your fitness, and your friendships. God bless.